morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's House for Worship today. Today is Trinity Sunday, another festival Sunday in the church here. And we're going to look at, of course, the work of the triune God, who he is. But especially today, focus in on the work of the Holy Spirit and all he does to reassure us that we belong to the Lord. Order of service is in your worship folder and on screen. At this time, let's begin with our opening hymn, 195. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Do not hide your face from us when we are in distress. God, our Father, we have forgotten that our world and homes, bodies, and nourishment, possessions, and loved ones are all gifts from you. We have taken these blessings for granted and used them selfishly rather than in service to you. Lord, Son of God, we were born dead in sin and deserving eternal wrath. We have rebelled against you and returned to our sin more times than we can count. Lord, have Spirit of God, we have doubted your word and been indifferent toward learning it. We have loved life in this world more than the eternal life you call us to inherit. Lord, The Lord rose up and had mercy on us. He sent his son to take on our human nature, to fulfill the demands of the law for us, and to suffer our condemnation at the cross. As a cult servant of this risen Christ and by his authority alone, 
I forgive you all of your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Father, dwelling in majesty and filling creation with your spirit, reveal your glory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us from doubt and fear and send us boldly into all the world to worship you with your Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, living and reigning now and forever. first lesson we have this morning is from Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah seeing the glory of the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is the word of our Lord. We sing Psalm 50 together.
chapter 8 and serves as a basis for the sermon. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of our Lord. Continue with the anthem. Please stand for the Gospel. The Gospel according to John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever, has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Please be seated for the hymn of the day, number 241. our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, dear fellow believers, in your one true God. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. Yeah, he loves me not. That game supposedly originated in France a number of years ago, and you're supposed to take a daisy 
And as you go down, back and forth, between love or lovelessness, you're supposed to peel one of those petals off one at a time, and then whatever the last petal falls to, that's what the answer is. Maybe love, maybe not. For that other person, I think that's the way the world treats religion. There's a whole grab bag of gods that are out there and and you just choose one for yourself and hopefully, maybe, with the roll of the dice, hopefully, at the end of your life and even during your life on earth, it's going to end on he loves you, but I guess you never really can know. The triune God doesn't leave his love to chance, to a roll of the dice, or to a back-and-forth game like that. Christianity is not some long-shot lottery ticket that hopefully at the end of your life it lands on He loves me, not He loves me not. Because the triune God does love you. And in a general way, the triune God does love all people. As we saw in the Gospel lesson, for God so loved the world The triune God loves people and specifically loves you. He makes that clear today through our our lesson in Romans. And he wants that repeated to the people of God over and over again. And even more than that, as your life goes on day by day in this world, he wants you to see the evidence of it. He wants you to know with certainty that God loves me. And you can see that displayed and flowered in your own life. The first way... Paul tells us God loves us is by the way the Holy Spirit leads us. He says right away, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Maybe the better way to say this is not, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Maybe we throw that away for a second and change it. The Spirit leads me or he leads me not. The Holy Spirit leads me. The Spirit leads me not. You understand the Holy Spirit is a leader. The Holy Spirit loves to lead people and to lead the people of God. That's what he's here to do from last Sunday at Pentecost. And so maybe really the better question is, are you being led by the Spirit? Is he your leader? A lot of people in the world today, they claim Christianity, but they're not showing any evidence of of putting that into practice. A lot of people claim, I'm a spiritual person. And they just mean whatever they want it to mean. Do Do you know in general, to be a spiritual person means you're led by the Holy Spirit. That's where that term comes from. Spirituality comes from the Holy Spirit. You can't be spiritual if you're not led by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit shows a huge difference in those he leads. Can you see it? Can you see the difference in the way the Holy Spirit leads the people of God over the way this wicked world leads people to be thankless? Can you see the difference in Christian parents disciplining their kids for good, even though it's really tough to hold the line day after day in godly, upright, loving Christian discipline versus the way the world lets kids rule the roost and wreck the home because it puts kids in charge and caters to them? Can you see the way godly Christian people strive to be generous givers? To the Lord, selfless givers, putting the Lord and his ministry as a top priority over the way the world teaches stinginess and chintziness and hang on to it and go for all the toys that you want in your life. Make yourself happy. Can you see the way God the Holy Spirit leads his people to love the word of God? To read it even in their own homes, on their own in privacy, as well as to treasure their time in the house of the Lord around the word of God? over the way this world teaches people to ignore it, to despise it, to make yourself king of your own castle, to go your own way. It's a huge difference because the way the Holy Spirit leads people is to deny themselves, 
to crush their sinful nature, to turn away from their sinful flesh and the things that they want to the things of God. That's a struggle for the Christian. Have you never felt that tug of war in your own heart? Every one of us has been tempted in here not to go to church. Every one of us has been tempted in here, if you've been a parent, to cater to your kids and to let them have their sinful uh, child tantrum way and just to give them what they want so that we can do what we want. (laughs) Maybe just have some peace. Every single one of us has been tempted in here to be chintzy and a cheapskate and to hoard for ourselves and not to be generous with God. Every single one of us is in here has been tempted not to read the word of God and to let it go because there's other stuff we want to do. But do you see what you're doing? Do you see, do you see the result of the Spirit right now, this very moment in your life? You're here. The Holy Spirit led you here. You're following the Word of God. You're listening to the Word of God. You're striving to take this to heart and put it into practice against everything in your your sinful nature and in the world that says do the opposite. You're striving to let the Holy Spirit lead you in life, not because He loves you not but because you've seen he loves you. He loves you and what he teaches you, that he leads you in paths of righteousness, that he leads you in all godliness, and he's a fantastic leader. He says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. <clears throat> in Roman society, they, they had a culture that was very similar to ours in this particular way. You had a lot of gods to choose from. So when the Romans would conquer an area, one of the things they would, they would do is they would determine after they conquered an area whether they wanted to take those gods from that area they conquered and incorporate them into their polytheistic uh, worship and religious life. And so when they conquered the Sabian area, they decided to do that. They took 23 gods from that territory and they incorporated them into the Roman religious worship life. And so now they had 23 new gods. Gods like Jupiter, Diana, Fortuna, and 20 more. That just sounds incredible to me. They chose gods to be over them. They adopted gods by their own human decision to be their gods. And now let's take it a step further. They not only chose their own gods and adopted gods to be over them, but they adopted gods to be over them who enslaved them. Mind you, there was no gospel with these gods. There was no good news. There was no forgiveness of sins. There was no freedom. Back then, there was no concept of serving a God who loved you and serving that God without fear. There was no concept of that outside of of Christianity. Christianity was the only religion that did that and still today does that. Now, who does that? Who adopts and chooses a God to be over them that forces them to be a slave, that forces them to do things out of guilt and shame and fear and obligation and have to, and it's a terrorizing relationship. Every single one of those gods that the Romans chose to be over them was a situation of, he loves me not. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves you. That's from the very first moment of this relationship with the Holy Spirit. How do you know that? Because He chose you. The Holy Spirit came to you. The Holy Spirit adopted you into His family. 
And he did that completely by grace, which means you and I didn't deserve it, but he did it because he loved us. Now, the whole concept of Roman adoption here is in the background. And you have to understand that when a Roman citizen adopted a non-Roman citizen, the Roman relationship trumped all prior relationships. Your adoption into a Roman family meant you were completely Roman. And so in practical terms, if you were a barbarian and a Roman family came and adopted you and brought you into their Roman family legally, all of those former ties are gone and you are completely through and through a Roman. That's exactly the same thing in Christian terms that's going on in Paul's, in Paul's text in Romans 8 here. The Holy Spirit handled all the legalities. In your baptism, the Holy Spirit came to you and took care of all of the red tape. He took care of all of your sin by bringing you to Christ and showing you how God paid in his own precious blood the price of your sin. He showed you how Jesus lived with his entire life, a holy life. And he takes that holy life and he clothes you in it so that it's yours. You are through and through by the Spirit's adoption and by the Spirit's work a member of the household of the family of God. And do you know what that does? It trumps all prior relationships. You're no longer a drug dealer. You're a child of God. You're no longer a drunk. You're a child of God. You're no longer a foul-mouthed teenager. You're a child of God. You're no longer a wayward pastor. You're a child of God. You're no longer whatever you were because you're forgiven through and through in Jesus Christ by the Spirit's adoption so that you belong to the house of God fully. That's who you are. The Bible itself says it. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's who you are. Because he loves you. And he brought this to you. And he testifies to this through the word of God. Day after day, as you and I open the word, he says his love over and over again and repeats who we are. He doesn't hold this back. You need to hear this. You need to hear this every day. Because the way the world is working, it's a terrorizing thing every day what's going on in the world that seeks to get at you. And then, of course, you and I still haven't lost our sinful nature, e even though God has forgiven us for it and clothed us with Christ. And so you and I have something that every day comes after us that seeks to bring us to a new low. It tempts us, and sometimes we fall for it, and it brings us to a new down. You and I live in a world that wants to pry into this relationship and partnership you and I have with the Holy Spirit, that wants to sever that and rip it apart and break it, break it down, so that instead we walk away from it and partner with the world instead. You, you need to understand this. Why would a Christian who so thoroughly sees the unconditional, gracious love of God, why would a Christian Walk away from that to what this world has to offer. Slavery. Hopelessness. Why would somebody exchange love from the Spirit and forgiveness for the world? If you go back to that Roman society, the Christians that were there living at that time, Day in and day out, they were plagued. They were terrorized. They were persecuted. They were brought down. They were killed for their Christianity. It was, if you will, a miserable existence back then to be a Christian. If you were found out, your life was on the line. And so to live with that suffering day in and day out was extremely challenging. Who of you today if the offer was really there to exchange a life on earth of suffering 
for a life of pleasure, for a life that would be easier, for a life where your business would flourish, you'd have a lot more contacts, you'd make a lot more money, you'd get along a lot better with people, it would just go that much better for you? Who of you here wouldn't be tempted to throw away Christianity for a life on earth that would be much more tolerable? Do you see then that even today we're tempted to choose our own God? Do you see today that we're tempted to get rid of the triune God and the work of the Holy Spirit to pick our own? To throw out sections of the Word of God that are so hard to apply to our lives because they're challenging and they they bring us into conflict with the world and to choose things that will make it easier and go well for us. Wow, in a lot of ways, we're just like the Romans. In that Roman culture. In fact, you'd be surprised how often it comes to my ears, even from comments around here. Oh, I, I just can't go with that teaching. That, that one's way too hard. And we don't study it. And we don't look into it deeper. Do you see how even we get bucky with the Holy Spirit? How we can challenge him, how we can defy him. I want to make just a a little but strong point here. Hell is filled with people who got bucky with the Spirit. Hell is filled with people who defied and walked away from the Spirit's love. And so today he counsels us again by the word. To take our sin and buckiness and stinginess and chintziness and wanting the easy way out, and to take all of those things and to take it back to Jesus, and to find forgiveness again in our Savior Jesus Christ, and to find how God restores us back to a child in the family. And He does so by grace. And instead of crying out against the Lord and trying to go our own way, to partner with the Spirit again in the joy of forgiveness, to take our hardships and struggles, to take the tensions that we face day in and day out, and with the Holy Spirit, to take them to our Heavenly Father. What does it say? By Him we cry out, Abba, Father, as a dear child says to their dear Father in Heaven, Help us! And He does. Paul writes, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. One of the things God holds out to us is to say there is an end to suffering. It's not going to be in this world, but, but it's going to come. There's going to be an end to sin. There's going to be an end to your suffering. There's going to be an end to shame. There's going to be an end to guilt. Certainly, that starts in Christ, where he gives you the peace of salvation. But there will come a daily existence where sin is no more. And the term for that here is you're an heir. You're an H-E-I-R, an inheritor of eternal life. You're an heir of the coming glory that's to come. That's legal. That's only something that comes to a child that's in the family. And because you're a legal child of the family of God... This inheritance belongs to you. And Paul uses a powerful phrase. He says, you're a co-heir of Christ. If anybody deserved eternal life and all the the coming inheritance, it's Jesus. Yeah, he earned it. But he says, you're a co-heir of Christ. Even though you and I didn't earn it, even though you and I don't deserve it, Everything that Jesus deserves coming his way, because you're a child through faith in Jesus Christ, that's yours. That's coming your way. And God will do it. Because he loves you. On this Trinity Sunday, there's something God wants to make incredibly clear day after day to you. And he wants to take all of the guesswork out And I know the circumstances of this world, they cause us to guess. And yet God through his word says, no, there's no guesswork here. I love you. 
in the way the Holy Spirit leads you, in your adoption into the family of God, that's legit and legal. The Holy Spirit made that happen. And in the way he lifts you up to see that the coming glory is yours. Worship and serve your triune God without fear. Because you're loved. Amen. At this time, if the congregation would remain seated, I didn't put it in the worship folder, but we have a special circumstance today. We have Roxy Coward here, and she would like to join our congregation and profess her unity of faith with you. So at this time, I'm going to invite Roxy forward for induction as a, as a new member. Dear members of St. Paul's, Roxy has been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, and she desires to become a member of this congregation with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. You've come before this Christian congregation, Roxy, to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and ask you to lift up your heart to God, which means to be honest with God and with us. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church as you've come to know it from our Bible information class, that it is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, to be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and to lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations, Roxy. This is an incredible day. Now, you can turn around and face the congregation. Um, I don't know that, no, Luther and I tag team teaching her this Bible information class. I think this class went double or triple the normal length because Roxy had so many questions. She just has a vibrant faith and she just loves to dig into the Word of God and know it. And you can see from her personality, she just loves people. And uh, just a wonderful addition to God's kingdom and, and God's family and our family of believers here. I'm so thrilled to have you here. So welcome again and congratulations. You can return to your seat. And if you want to greet people afterwards with me, we, we'd love that. And now if you would stand as we join together in confessing our faith with the Athanasian Creed, part one. <clears throat> Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons and three persons in one God without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. For each person, the Son and the Holy Spirit is distinct, but the deity of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite. The Son infinite. The Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal. The Son eternal. The Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal. Just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, but there is one who is uncreated, and one who is infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, 
The Son is Almighty, and the Holy Spirit is Almighty. Yet they are not three who are Almighty, but there is one who is Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet they are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet they are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually to be God and Lord, so the true Christian faith forbids us to speak of three gods or three lords. The Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Son neither made nor created, but is begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And within this Trinity, none comes before or after, none is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of the Trinity. This time we bring the offerings forward. Triune God, you are the one eternal God whose name we praise forever. We could not have known you, our only Savior, if you had not revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, yet one God. God, our Father, whatever good is in us, whatever good things we have, and whatever good we do comes from you alone. In you we live and move and have our being. Lord Jesus, our Savior, you came into our world to make the Father known to us. You joined yourself to us by taking on our humanity. You brought us back to God by shedding your blood at the cross. Creator Spirit, you have opened our eyes by the bright light of your word. You have burst through our deafness with the clear sound of your voice in the scriptures. You have breathed into us new life by the power of the gospel. Lord, for men and women who have gone before and laid down their lives, thanks seems hardly enough. But that's where it starts. We thank you for giving men and women to this country who gave it all to defend freedom. As even you have stated, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Give our country deep appreciation for the past, for the tremendous sacrifice of so many, that we would continue to live in a country so blessed. We ask you to bless the graduates from this weekend and still to come. Continue to bless them in their walk forward in faith and in life. Uh, we continue to ask you to bless Roxy Coward in her growth in faith as she partners with us in this congregation. And continue to bless the Claprick family as Tim Claprick's dad was hospitalized seriously recently. Uh, we ask that you continue to bless his dad as he uh, slowly recovers to health and restore him to his family. Hear us, Lord, as we now bring you our private petitions. We 
join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for hymn 186. God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. announcements. We do have Bible study, two of them this morning. A week from today, we start a single new Bible study. It's going to take place right here in church. We're going to go through over summer the book of 2 Corinthians. So close to about a chapter a day. Uh, That's how that'll work. Um, But as far as other announcements, we still do have church tomorrow night at 6.30. It's it's this service that you were just at. But if you know of anybody who 
ever wonders, do, do they have church on the holiday? We do. We just keep the regular schedule going so people can, uh, can depend on that. So I'll uh, pass that word along. Church tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, I should say. Um, but other than that, any, any announcements from you for this weekend or the week ahead? And please greet one another. God's blessings to all of you. Roxy, if you want to come on out and say hi to people, they'd love that. Thank you. Melody, too. <laughs>